thank you all so much for being here. I am really, really excited to welcome back uh, Megan Black. Um, Megan is an associate professor at MIT and she works really uniquely, I think, at the crux of a whole set of fields that interest many of us in SIGU. So most obviously perhaps environmental history, but also the history of capitalism, the history of American politics and foreign relations in particular, and STS as well, the history of the American West and settler colonialism. Um, Megan's first book, if you haven't read it, is utterly brilliant. I regularly press it on students. The Global Interior, Mineral Frontiers and American Power, published by Harvard University Press in 2018. I, it quite, quite rightly won four major awards. Four? Five? Four? Just four. Including the major award, award in my field of environmental history, the George Perkins Marsh Prize. And I say rightly because it's a really, really gripping read. Megan shows us how the humble US Department of the Interior went from being a domestic department focused on natural resource conservation and the man management of Indian affairs in the US itself to operating really globally. So we see the Department of the Interior everywhere from Liberia, Latin America, the Middle East, through to the offshore oil reserves of the continental sh shelf and all the way up into the off the uh, out of this world. Yeah, the, the really the offshore, offshore, indeed, uh, in outer space with the role of the Department of the Interior in developing satellite technology, which was also used for mineral exploitation. So through all this, Megan showed us how to quote, environment itself became a means and logic of intervention in the search for what we might today call critical minerals. Um, and I think on the way shows us, really unsettles a lot of the binaries we might have between say politics and nature, between the home and the abroad, between hard and soft power, and between public and private. Today we're gonna hear about her second major book length project, I'm very excited, which explores a very different set of interscalar and transnational reckonings between mining multinationals and international NGOs. So please join me in welcoming Megan Black. Thank you. Wow, first I need to thank Liz for that exceptional introduction. I feel that it's, you know, calling attention and drawing out threads of the work that I've already done in new and exciting ways. Um, and let me also thank uh, several people here. I want to thank Frederick, Liz, and Neil for the hard work that they've been putting into these SIGU conversations. It's a delight um, to see the level of energy and creativity, uh, and it takes a lot to do this institutional work. But here I see the rewards um, being reaped already. And I am going to start without a mic. Are people okay? Can you hear me in the back row so far? Excellent. Do please give me a shout or some kind of visible signal if you need more. I also want to thank Carlo Diaz for helping to um, set up the kind of logistics of my, my travel here and the lectern. And also Alexander Arroyo, I hear, has done these beautiful, I mean, I've seen the flyers and they're gorgeous and I just want to thank you for your labor. Okay. so. I want to begin a little bit differently in this talk than I might have, say, a week and a half ago based on some pretty recent developments and a recent experience that I had at a multinational mining uh, conference that MIT hosted. So I'm improvising a little bit here, but I, I think it will help to connect. Last week at this conference, I encountered the map that you see before you, which visualizes in one form the global footprint of mining. Now, the report that it's drawn from estimates that 50 million square kilometers of the Earth's terrestrial surface are impacted by mining past and present, which is roughly 37% of the terrestrial surface um, when you take away Antarctica. The map is surfacing at a moment of major transformation motivated by an increasingly common refrain. I'm sure some of you have encountered this. Mining will help to bring about the clean energy future, we are told. And this stems from the idea that renewable infrastructure is meant to facilitate incredibly important decarbonization goals 
Um, things like solar photovoltaic panels, um, wind turbines, electric vehicles, of course, are indeed made from a broad assemblage of minerals. Some of these are more well known, the hot button elements of lithium and cobalt. Others are more cross cutting and banal, like say copper or molybdenum, the latter of which I'll talk about a bit more. They're being rebranded energy transition metals or ETMs. And, um, and a point that I'll be drawing out in the more focused case study or the history that I'm looking at is that, of course, these metals come from somewhere, though often those, those somewheres are a bit out of sight. Ramp ups in mineral exploration and extraction are um, hardly new. And this is a point that I did make in my first book project, which Liz so nicely summarized. Part of what I tried to apprehend then was how the networks of power driving extraction, including say those humble operatives in the interior department that I followed, have extended outward across the surface of the globe. But we also know that of course, minerals and mining reach deep into the earth in particular places. And here's where I'm seeing a kind of disconnect or a mismatch in some sense, where histories of extractive capitalism often have to choose between following along one or another track um, that I think are, are nicely encapsulated by the covers, like the visualizations of these books that I'm super inspired by. Um, so it's been difficult to connect the stories of say, the, the kind of global networks and the place-based um, mining stories. And it's been difficult by design. I'm gonna say that you know, multinational mining actually really depends on this, this difficulty. Even as we know that, to kind of refer back to this map, global extractive operations leap across hundreds and even thousands of mine sites. It creates a kind of pointillist global mine, to borrow the frame from Daniel Immervar's pointillist empire in the study of US imperialism. The operations span non-human ecosystems, myriad legal regimes, they constitute Byzantine joint ventures at times, and they're messy by design. But I have seen people over time who have fought to make sense of this mess, and that they've done so at, at sort of different sites or with different scales at their at their forefront. So on the one hand, people fought locally in particular places for the power to shape the more than human world within reach, but they also fought to build out international networks that could offer a kind of counterpoint to the points being made on this map. And this is the kind of problem that I'm trying to grapple with in my new book project tentatively called Earth Movers, Multinational Mining and Environmental Challengers in a Global Village. This isn't a real cover, it's just helping me think with, and maybe Alexander, I can talk to you about your skill set later. Um, but part of what I'm you know, reckoning with is how, um, as the geographers have told us for a long time, these scales are, um, are worth holding in the same frame, and I'm trying to grapple with the challenges historically and narratively of bringing those stories into the same frame. For my part, working in this multi-scalar register, I'm exploring how international debates about mining became grounded in local places through the lightning rod activity of mining itself, as communities grappled with the prospect of shouldering certain material burdens. So in the moment of the 1970s, we're talking about an intensification in globalization and technology technologies that could facilitate that. Um, and, and that's the, the kind of context and the backdrop of the story. So I focus on the multinational corporation AMAX on the one hand and the environmental NGO Friends of the Earth on the other, um, which were advancing and hoping to embed radically different visions for the future, one for profit, one not for profit, one insisting on growth's importance, one insisting on the limits to growth. And I'll note, you know, works like Frederick have certainly showcased this debate and its multiplicity across a long arc of time. Um, I'm looking at a kind of moment in the 1970s when it became pronounced and when many different kinds of actors were, were taking up stances on, on different parts of this spectrum. I'm broadly thinking of AMAX and Friends of the Earth as a kind of, as globe spanning organizations that might meaningfully be connected as earth movers, right? As this kind of conceptual frame, not only in the sense of moving earthly rock, flora and fauna, but also 
in the sense of seeking to move people to fight on Earth's behalf and to build a movement. And while you know, many hundreds of communities around the world grappled with these choices, I will focus on a tiny town in the U.S. West, Crested Butte, Colorado, as one of these kind of moments of touching ground. Crested Butte is at an elevation of around 9,000 feet, and it was in the late 1970s confronted with the prospect of a vast mining operation at their doorstep. And for the rival networks I'm tracing, it became a kind of showdown at high altitude, a moment of reckoning for the two. So today I want to proceed as follows. I want to give a snapshot of the clash over globalization as it materialized in Crested Butte. And I'll say that in the kind of broader book project, I'm experimenting with perspective in ways that draw from insights across an incredibly robust field in environmental history and adjacent enterprises. So I begin with a chapter that situates a deep time history of the mountain at the center of the story, um, spending you know, attention thinking about the thousands of years of Tabawachi Ute people's um, world making in that space in their ancestral homelands, and then tracing the arrival of European settler miners um, in the late 19th century. I then try to trace in the late 20th century um, the kind of globe spanning and the more place-based interactions. And in the way I'm trying to conceive of this chapter organization is to track the paths into town from a more um, capacious international perspective to a deeply local perspective in the middle, giving it time and space to see the mechanisms of multinational mining, and then zooming out as actors um, make their paths out of town, the company, but also the activists. And today I'll spend most of the time in that hyper-local example, a middle chapter that sees a town divided and confronted with the presence of these international organizations who are trying to localize their appeal and advance their different causes. The town majority embraced the NGO Friends of the Earth's vision, and they opted to say or try to say no to mining. And I maintain in the process they're embracing this multi-scalar ethos that on the one hand helped them to make sense of their um, condition, their, their struggle, but on the other hand was a means to try to drum up extra local support and investment in their uphill battle. And this is you know, captured by the slogan of globalization we're pretty familiar with, um, when the, the mayor of Crested Butte, W. Mitchell, who I'll talk about a little bit more, claims Crested Butte has decided to think globally and act locally. In the end, we'll see that the unthinkable seemed to happen. The company retreated. And the, the problem that I'll be trying to grapple with is that, of course, the story does not end there, though sometimes the place-based accounts that we have stop at that moment of whether a community gets to say yes or no to mining. Um, and I'll try to track how the conflicts continue across other sites as um, communities less able to say no than see AMAX extend these extractive operations elsewhere. That's where I hope we can, we can get in the next uh, little while. As a starting point, the 1970s, Crested Butte, a former gold and coal mining town, had become home to a new generation of migrants, transplants from coastal cities who wanted to, I don't know, go up the country roads and seek the Rocky Mountain High. In this, John Denver was broadly influential. He was also a part of this already existent trend. W. Mitchell, who you see on the left, was the charismatic mayor who fit this bill. He had relocated from first Philadelphia and later San Francisco to Crested Butte after two horrific accidents unfolded in sequence. First, a motorcycle accident, and then a Cessna plane crash that um, left him with extensive burns and using a wheelchair. He moved to what he jokingly called the least wheelchair accessible town in the United States, where he had hoped that um, by finding a small community and by finding nature, he would find both respite and would avoid drawing stairs. The town was in the midst of reorienting its economy to tourism, and newcomers like Mitchell, as he argued, were seeking, quote, the richness of, not the richness in, the mountain. Then in 1977, AMAX arrived. And I should say, AMAX Inc. was one of the largest and most influential multinational mining firms of its moment. 
um, with investments reaching from the Colorado Mineral Belt to the African Copper Belt. The company's violent dealings in the latter actually inspired the son of one of the chairmen of this company to part ways with the family business and become a historian of extractive capitalism. That's Adam Hochschild, um, the author of King Leopold's Ghost. Having a front row seat to the kind of mining operations in uh, Central and Southern Africa did not inspire much um, joy for him. <laughs> Amex in the 1970s was under a new chairman, Ian McGregor seen here. He was also Margaret Thatcher's right-hand man in union busting against the coal strikes in the 1980s. So that's where he'll end up after this. Um, McGregor led a policy of expansion and diversification, which was an approach well known today. It is commonplace and was both inspiring and, and drawing upon methods of rivals like say Exxon. In 1977, AMAX prospectors identified in the mountain outside Crested Butte a molybdenum deposit estimated to be the largest of its kind in the world, worth an $8 billion. It was a part of an earlier moment to try to mine more onshore, which we could talk about, um, based on this fear companies expressed that decolonization and the emboldening of labor and other rights and places around the global south would prevent business as usual abroad. When AMAX announced its intent to mine in Crested Butte, most townspeople were aghast. The mine, they learned, was only going to be the beginning, right? And from there, an estimated 100 to 300 million tailings would be transferred more than 12 miles away to a tailings pond that was 3,000 acres wide, held back by a dam that was 400 feet tall. So large-scale mining, in short, that AMAX helped to set the template of, and I'd love to discuss precisely how they did this, um, certainly because it is still very much the template, template in um, modern mining. Crested Butte citizens were asking, how could this happen? And the short answer was, the molybdenum was in public lands. Okay. The longer answer is the abiding force of the mining law of 1872, um, both then in this moment and to the present, which allows companies to um, tie up many thousands of acres of public land in mining operations. And I talk about, I have a whole chapter that's really devoted to this topic as the town tries to understand this. Um, newly arrived residents like um, Miles Rademan, who we see here, fit a certain kind of socioeconomic bill. Many of them were extremely well educated from the East and West Coast. Some were affluent with trust funds. Rodeman, for his part, was an NYU educated lawyer turned urban planner who um, had been lured to Colorado supposedly over a joint um, with a recruiter from Lyndon Johnson's Colorado Rural um, Legal Services. But, um, but ultimately, Rodeman was like many people newly arrived in the town who thought the mine would be a travesty. Locals founded a conservation group called the High Country Citizens Alliance and vocalized a kind of nebulous opposition to the mine, but they had no idea what to do next. And here's where the NGO Friends of the Earth comes into the picture by chance. And they are the, the friends in high places that I'm trying to work through in my title. I am really bad at chapter titles, so please come talk to me later if you have better ideas for how to describe this. So founded by David Brower in the summer of 1969, Friends of the Earth had become one of the most influential international organizations in the U.S. and the world. Brower had been the executive director of the Sierra Club during its like largest enrollment period or it's like a period of um, notoriety. And yet he found it to be provincial and, and held back by a lack of attention to the planetary scale, by a lack of ecological consciousness. So with his new network, he um, helped to launch offices across the world in the United Kingdom, France, Argentina, Brazil, Australia, New Zealand, and many more places where they all aim to bring, quote, global action at the local level. So the organization would also create networks of branch representatives who could be responsive when grassroots action sprung up somewhere. They would, they would go mostly in their Volkswagen Beetles to those sites of conflict. And Scholars have, have tackled this organization already. So Jennifer Thompson and Keith Woodhouse have helped show how Friends of the Earth contributed to mainstream environmentalism, all while trying to sort out and identify with the cutting edge of the environmental movement. They were super critical of industry and growth, of toxics and carbon emissions. 
But despite these intentions, there were very clear barriers to the transformative politics that they pursued, and we should absolutely center those in our, in our thinking. Firstly, the well-documented neo-Malthusianism of both Brower and Friends of the Earth meant that population, which was inextricable from racial thought and exclusions, was often a central preoccupation alongside a broader issues inventory. This caused fragmentation, so um, the organization's parts ways with Barry Commoner is like one kind of example of this, this, um, this controversial um, but also mainstream fixation. Another barrier to their cutting edge program is the way the organization would, by the 1980s, deprioritize the local and embrace the national. They thought, we have to be a national lobbying agency. Um, their ex legislative director, Rafe Pomerantz, was one of the, was arguably the most important activist to bring the science on carbon emissions and global warming to the halls of um, government in a moment of potential, before it was this foregone conclusion that um, the negotiations would break down. So that had taught the importance of legibility and working within, say, governance and not, say, across this diffuse network of grassroots organizing. So I'm going to bracket that national lobbying story for a minute because it is documented elsewhere. What I want to tease out is what happened between the local and global in these kind of um, early contests with Friends of the Earth and larger um, representatives of industry. And I'll say Friends of the Earth had made inroads fighting multinational companies. They did it largely through a very successful publishing arm that called attention to the problem and helped build opposition to mines. And by 1977, AMAX was pretty sick and tired of this nonsense. Part of what I track is the constant um, encounter the, the many times their paths crossed in the lead up to this moment. So um, from college campuses and congressional hearings to the UN conference on the human environment in Stockholm in 1972, this kind of well-known touchstone in, um, in environmental governance. And what was, you know, Unfolding in those spaces, of course, are like argument and counter argument. So the company is saying, of course, we must assure growth. Don't even think about the polluter pays principle. The NGO was arguing precisely the opposite. And from this, there are many examples we could point to where it's like a match, a rematch, and a, a repeat between um, the leaders of these organizations. As the town of Crested Butte in 1977 was grappling with AMAX's announcements, one of its most seasoned organizers, a man named Ed Dobson, arrived in town um, for a routine wilderness lecture. Dobson had uprooted his life to become a Friends of the Earth branch representative with you know, $17.83 in his pocket. And in short order, he had secured some serious bona fides fighting mining companies. So he was actually in the middle of a lawsuit um, with a mining company collaborating with AMAX to secure public lands in Montana when he arrived in Crested Butte. In Dobson's words, it was the classic case of right place, right time, because Crested Butte needed someone who, quote, was not about to shrink from the awesome power of the international conglomerate. The townspeople told Dobson what AMAX was promising. There would be minimal social and environmental disturbances. Dobson clapped back. Years of experience had taught him that companies would indeed easily and without restraint um, disturb surfaces in public lands, even in the wake of new NEPA legislation or National Environmental Policy Act legislation. There were few preventative mechanisms in the first phases of mining called exploration, which would get a de facto stamp of approval from bureaucrats and no opportunity for input from local communities. So Dobson, shared the strategies from other battles with the town. He said, um, Here's, uh, here are our legal arguments that we used. Here are the, the kind of examples we pointed to and evidence of how extraction destabilized and overburdened different environments, including existing roads, um, generating new infrastructure that, um, that in turn had consequences for air and water quality that um, threatened habitats and wildlife migration. AMAX at the same time, of course, had its own operatives conveying a very different message to the town about what it was offering. Um, they were trying to shape public opinion or, quote, to win hearts and minds, which is 
a phrase that I heard an industry representative use like five days ago um, and not with any kind of awareness about its history. As one local in Crested Butte would later summarize, those guys at AMAX are the best at conquering the natives. And we can and should talk about the politics and the imaginaries around settler and indigenous people in this, in this context. Um, it was one of many examples where community members invoked symbolically indigenous struggles um, while ultimately claiming a shared experience of colonization in ways that served a rather narrow set of um, local goals. AMAX hired a local ski instructor to the company payrolls, which is pretty classic. Find a local, make them your, your um, hype man. Um, he became a mayor of a town uh, six miles up the road. And they also were busy broadcasting the, the, the glamorous side of molybdenum, which not many people knew about. If you're in that boat, you're in good company. Um, like its more famous cousin titanium, it was appreciated, especially in the kind of space age, for its um, its chemical, um, for its for its hardening capacities, for its heat resistance. It was used in automobiles and infrastructure, pipelines, lubricants, an array of satellites and other space-based technologies. They also were very much invested in in communicating um, their. Uh, environmental modernization, uh, their, their sort of advanced approach to, to minimizing environmental impact. Their newsletters would um, also feature comic strips, sanitizing mining protocols. Here we see a, wo a woman who personifies Molly, like molybdenum, um, checking to make sure that the surface disturbances are not bothersome to the squirrel on the right. Um, and they also were um, primarily trying to feed the nostalgia of an earlier mining generation that still lived there. So on the right you see their historical research, their features about mines, uh, storied mines from the past, in order to appeal to old timers. And some of these stories were fitting of Norman Rockwell. We learn in the kind of highlighted section that workers were warmed by the glowing coke ovens on a cold winter's day. To counter the AMAX PR machine, the town got creative, and here they borrowed extensively from Friends of the Earth tactics, including the power of merch, t-shirts sold in stores, buttons, and protest songs. The mountain song would be recorded by John Denver, who would get involved in their struggle. And this is not to say that Friends of the Earth was a puppet master. Locals had their own creative strategies, their street theaters, their engagements in high school gymnasiums. But, um, and some rebellious townspeople would say, um, shoot AMAX's caterpillars and, and equipment or sugar their gas tanks. But ultimately, Dobson and Friends of the Earth helped to take these kind of disparate strategies and scale them out to audiences from the local to regional and national, all while framing the conflict as a part of a much more international struggle. And the NGO and its approach became especially useful, I should say, after attempted inroads with government did not bear fruit. So town leaders like Mayor Mitchell tried and failed to get support at the state and federal level in the late 1970s. Mitchell had traveled to DC and he got a series of no's or sorry we can't helps from say, Governor Richard Lamb, Senator Floyd Haskell, House Interior and Insular Affairs leader, Morris Udall, Secretary of the Interior, Cecil Andrus, and President Jimmy Carter. Mitchell instead focused efforts on formalizing ties between Crested Butte and NGOs like Friends of the Earth, traveling to San Francisco to meet Brower. The two hit it off. Brower not only enlisted Mitchell to be on his board of directors, but would help to found the smallest branch of Friends of the Earth in Crested Butte. Membership roles, I should note, were key to the funding model of the organization, so there was a desire to do this. Friends of the Earth personnel from Brower to Dobson had seen communities build traction by scaling out, by gaining media attention. This is the story of Brower's contest with the Bureau of Reclamation over the damming of the um, Colorado River, um, the, the damming of the Grand Canyon. And part of what he had done was uh, get attention grabbing ads placed. So one um, famous one that ran was, should we also flood the Sistine Chapel so tourists can get nearer the ceiling? This kind of cheeky um, branding that 
that became a part of the strategy in this Crested Butte conflict as well. Dobson was looking for something equally vivid, but also specific. And this is when a local proposed a ski-in demonstration, which uh, would take place over the 23 miles between Aspen and Crested Butte. Now this was to raise awareness, and Dobson saw massive potential. Daring, funny, and eminently photographable, um, it would be ready-made for print and media television. So the next day, Dobson arranged for Friends of the Earth to sponsor this demonstration, and he arranged to go with them to the mountaintop so he could report on the adventures at high altitude over you know, 12,000 feet. This is another way that there is a friend in an actual high place, and again, I need help with titles. Um, so this was made a little more difficult by the fact that Dobson didn't know how to ski and had had an emergency root canal surgery the day before, but he felt it was important to go, and the participants then you know, heroically arrived before CBS and NBC cameras on the other side of their journey. Through a combination of this kind of clever organizing and networking, Crested Butte would receive more and more news coverage, 60 mainstream newspaper stories, 16 magazine articles, including one of the first environmental features in Sports Illustrated. And within a year, that's when Denver recorded their mountain song. So there's much to say about a ski-in demonstration, and to be sure, uh, the historian Annie Gilbert Coleman's brilliantly titled article, The Unbearable Whiteness of Skiing, comes to mind. It reminds us that perhaps the eco-revolution was not going to start with skiers whose overnight heroics included a wine and cheese party. The townspeople, like many environmental leaders, had a narrow vision of environmental well-being that at best overlooked the disproportionate social and environmental tolls befalling historically marginalized groups, and at worst blamed such communities for social and environmental ills via, say, the language of crime or population. And living in this veritable white enclave, it's unsurprising that their vision did not include multiracial solidarity. But the town would also, with Friends of the Earth's help, um, imagine other connections to other communities beyond their own small town. And in this, we see this in the Aspen Ski and Demonstration when Dobson is um, giving a speech on Brower's behalf that frames the struggle as one of many taking shape across the globe. The speech situated the confrontation between Crested Butte and Amex as, quote, one of the most significant conservation developments in the decade. On the one hand, a small town who sought to use public lands in ways agreed upon by the public. On the other side, a giant multinational corporation. Amex chased growth. Communities around the world were left with social and environmental tolls. The problem was obvious in the way Amex wanted molybdenum not out of some internal need from the nation, but something external to it. And here's where they helped to frame a kind of global struggle. The balance of payments, Dobson as Brower would argue, is why Amex is seeking to mine Mount Emmons. And he noted that in recent years, manufactured goods constituted the largest import category to the US, which created a colonial arrangement that they framed as much akin to what happened in 1776. In Dobson's words, forced export of raw materials and import of manufactured goods was a major reason we went to war in the American Revolution. So this global narrative then ended with this one-two punch that you see here. Today's multinational corporations have assumed the role of empire builder. Now, townspeople took these ideas and ran with them. Um, the town council's position paper railed against how molybdenum quotes returns to us as manufactured, foreign manufactured goods with a high markup that displaced American jobs, destabilizes the economy, and unbalances the balance of payments. Townspeople also pointed to the company's global footprint as the reason for their own peril and outrage. So they cited the investment portfolio, nickel in Botswana, zinc in Newfoundland, iron in Australia, oil in the Gulf of Mexico and North Sea in Western Australia. But with this mapping in place, the problem was less, oh, those communities are suffering too, than, oh, Crested Butte is meant to help with, be a write-off for these less um, economically viable parts of AMAX's portfolio. They, disputed Crested Butte's part financing such an international operation. 
um, throughout the town expressed a sense of besiegement, extending this metaphor of colonial occupation. So Rodman would say that their proposed tailings pond was like the Aswan Dam and they were welcoming an occupying army as a result. W. Mitchell perhaps exceeded them all. He would frame Crested Butte as one among many international battlefields. The town refused to become, quote, one of the world's newest mineral colonies, and more than that, was fighting for others who may not have the ability to mount the battle required when outsiders neither hear nor listen to a town that says no. And Mitchell summarized this mind put, mindset simply, Crested Butte has decided to think globally and act locally. Now, we might ask where Mitchell got this phrase. Often Brower and Friends of the Earth are credited with this. So William Cronin, for instance, has made this um, suggestion, but mistakenly so. Um, the originator of the phrase was by best accounts, the French biologist René Dubose, someone known to Brower and Dobson for his part shaping international environmental governance. But Mitchell is someone who had heard it first at a Vail Symposium, another kind of environmental conference at another ski enclave where Dubot had presented Think Globally, Act Locally as early as 1973. So in this sense, it's possible that Mayor Mitchell helped ferry the slogan from Colorado to Friends of the Earth. And you see much later Friends of the Earth using, as you see in this poster, that slogan to describe their own efforts. But the multi-scalar sentiment is something I'm really trying to think with. Moving between and across scales helped make sense of part of their predicament, but in a particular way uh, that, of course, uh, in enacted certain violences, um, trying to claim a, a parity with decolonial struggles around the world, struggles framed by their own um, encounters with violence and these um, blowbacks from, from history and was one of many instances of flattening, of harnessing symbolic disillusionment with colonialism, and was not enacting any kind of anti-colonial politics of non-domination in solidarity with people, but advancing a narrower set of goals about shaping their local landscapes. In the end, I'm gonna fast forward here to say, AMAX did back away from the investment in Crested Butte, Colorado. And the day of the announcement, the anti-mining coalition danced in the streets before gathering at the summit of the mountain they had defended, brandishing peace signs and woolen pullovers and huge smiles. They finally enacted their protest slogan, which had been bye bye AMAX. But the result, um, how do we think about the results of this activism? Was their multi-scalar strategies a significant piece of the story? Crested Butte citizens would concede that larger structural forces were at play. So Rodman later reflected, did we stop AMAX? No, the economy stopped AMAX. The price of molybdenum bottomed out. But there is also evidence suggesting that the town's privileged, well-networked coalition left its mark on the company. Company leaders had spent big to quell the noise from this politically active town, investing in the most expensive environmental programs across their vast network of um, extraction and refining operations. Um, a $12 million water treatment plant by, that was sixfold you know, more costly than any other kind of um, capitulation to environmental criticism that they had made. Their unusually well-platformed supporters, including the biologist and population bomb author, Paul Ehrlich, also were raising alarms about how AMAX threatened biodiversity and even extinction of entire species in his work, which led AMAX's upper echelon to try to get Ehrlich fired from Stanford, which they were very, very frustrated by tenure um, at, at the very least. Most tangibly, the company opted just a few months after the protest to found a new Office of Communications and Public Affairs, streamlining its public relations across a vast network, which was one step on the path to their eventually storied role molding corporate social responsibility. And there are works that say the origin of co corporate social responsibility is with this company. So in the short term, there were other fronts of extraction that became more attractive to AMAX. It redoubled its multi-commodity investments in Namibia and Papua New Guinea, in Nishka people's lands in British Columbia, in Unangora Aboriginal people's lands in Western Australia, and Maori lands in Waihee, New Zealand. And interestingly, Crested Butte activists did 
traveled to New Zealand and became a part of the struggle there alongside white settlers, you know, 10,000 miles away. Um, but ultimately, and you know, I detail this in later chapters, that coalition failed to prevent the, the mining, one of the largest open pit gold mines the world had at the moment. Ultimately, the social and environmental burdens of mining were not crested buttes to bear. And eventually, um, the, the story gets a little bit messier because while AMAX retreats to other sites of activity, it also never ever leaves Crested Butte, Colorado. And to this day, the company holds the parcels of land in the public domain um, and threatens, by the perspective of some, the community to return and mine molybdenum when its value increases. So the retreat to other nodes then assured its continuity in this specific place. And in this moment of the so-called energy transition metal intensification, um, community members have expressed concern that once again, their town will need to marshal a fight lest they be um, the people to shoulder the burdens of fighting a new problem, the Anthropocene. And of course, that's the term ported from the sciences to humanistic fields, however imperfectly to delineate humans as a planetary force. Scholars have been pushing us all, I think, to tell stories that can bring insights together from these different scales, from the granular to the sweeping, in order to think through environmental unravelings and achievements. And this is certainly where I'm trying to direct my efforts. Um, I am interested in moving between particular sites of extraction and the international dialogues favoring or opposing it, in part because I think the Crested Butte story, as one among many, cautions restraint in the face of another global scale set of transformations, including the, the ones meant to fight the climate catastrophe. Um, the history reminds us that certain mentalities from the fossil fuel era are poised to be continued in the hoped for renewable energy future, not only the growth mindset that became entrenched in no small part with help from earth movers like AMAX, but also the racial exclusions that came to dominate Main Street environmental thought with no help from those other earth movers, the friends of the earth. I want to hold these two regrettable legacies in mind, even as I want to be clear that in the end, multinational companies twisted the more than human world into this highly unequal and unsustainable shape far more than NGOs did. And speaking to this mismatch, it's worth noting that by the 1980s, both of these companies, or sorry, both of these organizations faced um, obliteration or uh, the verge of bankruptcy and collapse from being overextended, but to in, at orders of magnitude <laughs> of difference financially, right? So Friends of the Earth was overextended and in debt $600,000. AMAX was ex overextended and in debt $1.3 billion and got a new lifeline by being merged into one of the largest multinational firms today. So I, I want to think seriously about this. I'll open it up to conversation here rather than kind of continuing on. Um, it, too much here. I just want to return to this um, this map because alongside the, the material footprint that we see with multinational mining, um, we also want to think about the extended carbon footprint of multinational mining. Mining sector, the metals mining sector constitutes 11% of global energy use and much of the proposed mining is set to happen in areas set aside for biodiversity, a part of the sequestration calculus to say nothing of the value it has on its own right. And these lands, of course, also coincide disproportionately with indigenous people's lands. So, um, so developments are certainly happening, which, which raise the question about whether communities should be able to say no to mining. And will these communities be the same ones that have always been asked to bear this burden or not? Um, so on that, open-ended question. I'd like to turn it over to you all and, um, and ask for your help thinking through this kind of shifting um, perspectival exercise that I'm undertaking. Thank you very much. Do we sit? I think we sit. Okay, yeah. let's sit. So 
Yes, we've got plenty of time for q and A. I'm sure there are lots of questions. Uh, Frederick is wandering around with a mic. Counterintuitively, it will not project your voice, uh, but it will capture this for the recording. So please do wait until you've got the mic in hand. Yes. I no fans. Uh, in the context of branding, mm. you mentioned ETM. Mm, yeah. Is that a coinage by the mining companies, the mining lobbies? Because mm. it reminded me of the Frank Luntz memo to Bush to stop saying global warming mm -hmm. and start saying climate change yeah. as part of the mm -hmm. um, renovation mm -hmm. of Bush's uh, economy ecological uh, image yeah. so how effective has that coinage been mm -hmm. and ha i'm just curious just on on the non-local level yeah how this resistance manifested in uh news coverage mm. and in legislatures yeah uh, yeah. either in Congress or in the Colorado legislature. Yeah. Okay, great. Th those two questions I think are really important. Um, actually, your, your anecdote very nicely conveys the, the dynamic I see at play in this new ETM um, template, which is euphemism, right? Like a euphemism that covers over uh, a few things. One, the arbitrariness in some sense of how these minerals are linked. One thing that happens in the, the discourse globally from the World Bank to the corporations to um, different, uh, different communities is that minerals appear so natural as to be very difficult to countervail, right? Geologically, they are where they are and hence we go and extract them where they are. And this highly naturalized process is one that um, often covers over a lot the political and social worlds that say that those minerals need to be extracted at the pace that they are and the scale that they're being extracted. So I saw this in my first book with the category strategic minerals. That moment coincides with a kind of 1930s um, pre-war but in anticipation of war moment where officials said these don't have any chemical connections, these materials, but we don't have them in the United States. Ergo, they are strategic and critical. And that became such a, a kind of normalized category as to justify sweeping transformations and investments the world over. And I think energy transition metals with an eye towards something they weren't thinking about in the 30s, which is environmental impact, is very clear here. The metals mining is meant to open up an energy transition that, by the way, these same companies have been fighting tooth and nail with their oil and gas portfolios for many, many decades. So I think there's more to say there, but basically that what I hear in your question is, is, um, is something that I think accords with, uh, with earlier histories, trying to, to create euphemisms as well. The, the question of what manifests in a kind of national scale, let's say news media coverage, you can see a very clear difference in the placement of articles before and after. So the only way that Crested Butte got coverage before this 1979 moment when the New York Times then picks up their struggle and, um, and sort of shouts it from the mountaintops, so to speak, was when they placed them themselves, right? So community members are having to write their own pieces and they're trying to like plug them into special interest um, stories. After this, even the Denver Post is like the Denver Post wasn't covering their conflict before this 1979 moment, but after they were, and it became a much more regional and national story. The extent to which that translated to, to legislative change is like zero. There is no capitulation. There was a kind of short lived debate about whether they could all go after the mining law of 1872. And for a very short moment, Jimmy Carter and um, and Mo Udall and Lee Metcalf were trying to revise the mining law to become a story of leasing rather than this kind of in perpetuity um, patenting and an effective property ownership for the companies, but to no avail. They got destroyed by the, you know, the, the mining sector in that attempt. So the, the, the way that this manifests is um, more reputational. AMAX did in this moment seem to really care about 
um, its perception in ways that um, that in turn meant it would spend a lot of money until it realized that actually those um, expenditures are adding up and causing a kind of broader financial crisis that mapped on to inflation and their, the way that their um, financing was structured, right? They took out huge loans and then those loans 10 years in became uh, extremely cumbersome. So you might hear some ambivalence as I try to convey what, why the town, how to think of it as success or not, right? Like, is it truly that the, the price bottomed out? Not exactly, because the price, as we know, would rebound over time, and the mine never happened in Crested Butte. But what did consistently occur was political activism among a pretty affluent and well-connected group of people, um, including, I, I'll add, why Ehrlich is involved at all. The Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory, which is a key field station for ecological science, is eight miles away from Crested Butte. So there is this kind of attention to this place that doesn't exist in kind of equal stature to other kinds of places. Oh, sure. Hi, I'm Mary Beth Puttup, um, and I'm a SIGU faculty member. So I was super interesting. Um, I'm sort of thinking of what you've said in from a sort of history of organizing and activism, mm -hmm. and and really, th and like what came to mind immediately was sort of the Headwaters Forest struggle in California, okay. mm -hmm. and how that really had a completely different kind of organizing history, mm -hmm. really grounded in sort of earth first, you know, yeah. direct action. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if you could talk about the extent to which f Friends of the Earth sort of drove the bus, as mm. it were, because yeah. of its own particular organizational dynamics yeah. and what it chose to do. And, and mm -hmm. how it might have been different yeah. had there been more, you know, for want of a better word, grassroots mm -hmm. organizing. Yeah, that's a great question. And thinking about other NGOs at the time with different reputations and different kind of organizing structures, I think is really valuable. Friends of the Earth, I think, sought more legitimacy than Earth First, which they thought was perhaps more radical than their efforts. Um, especially as they were trying more and more to, to appeal to the national lobbying arm. They were less coordinated than something like Greenpeace, which had more of a centralized command structure. The idea that Brouwer had internationally and at that kind of grassroots local level was to give a lot of remit and range, no top-down directives in a sense, but a shared vocabulary and a shared literature, right? So one of the things Friends of the Earth was pretty um, excellent at was communication at a moment before the World Wide Web. Like, how can we let other communities know the tactics, the company line, um, and how can we help them think about what their counter arguments will be? And that's like a kind of glue that's holding communities together, even as Dobson is not leading the direct action. He is responding to kind of homegrown ideas and then helping to think about, you know, that, that um, kind of work of building an imagined community, trying to tell that the, the struggle in Crested Butte as though it might belong to more people than Crested Butte. Um, the, the way that Dobson theorized this relationship I found interesting because he regretted not being able to be present for them all the time, right? He lived out of his beetle some of the year but was mostly based in Montana. And he said, my job is to sink roots or at least the illusion of roots with local communities. And he recognized the, the limits because of the resources. They can't be there. Meanwhile, AMAX is there daily because they pay their employees to be there. And people to this day forget that Friends of the Earth was ever involved in their local struggle. You'd think they did it entirely on their own, um, unless you read the archive, right? And what they remember is this kind of um, collegial antagonism with AMAX, begrudging respect for the guys who they would fight with during, say, a high school gymnasium debate but then they would drink a beer with after at the same pub. And that, that is something about you know, the kind of coalition building that NGOs were uh, mindful of. This, this, um, this desire to, um, to be rooted and place-based and this inability at the same time to be rooted and place-based along the long durée of say a, a conflict or a development. And, and in that, it is absolutely true that the local community was in the driver's seat a lot of the time, equipped with tactics and knowledge 
um, and talking points from Friends of the Earth. So I want to take seriously that in the same way that I think Mitchell may have more responsibility gifting to Friends of the Earth the Think Globally, Act Locally slogan than you know, the company, or sorry, the organization. I'm really- I don't know, <laughs> exactly. Um, certainly gets credited instead, and, and it was more multi-directional than that. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, <laughs> Frederick Albright Johnson, I'm taking, yeah. seizing the mic for a moment. Um, uh, super interesting, Megan. Thanks so much for um, s visiting us and giving us a sneak preview of the book. Um, I want to push you on um, the temporal logic mm. of extractivism. Mm. Um, John Levy, in his wonderful book mm. about the ages of capitalism, mm -hmm. makes this, to me, incredibly compelling, mm -hmm. but also some somewhat unsatisfying mm -hmm. argument that the, the move from Fordism to post-Fordism mm. among corporations marks mm -hmm. a kind of narrowing and shrinking of the temporal horizon. Mm. Corporations mm -hmm. become more myopic as we move closer to the present. Yeah. Yeah. What do you make of that argument mm. in light of, you know, AMAC still having invested in land, you yeah. know, a, and you hint at this throughout in, you, in the Q&A and, mm -hmm. yeah. and in the talk that they're playing a long game. Mm -hmm. And I just want to remind people that this is, I think this is true of the origins of fossil capitalism and the mm. deep mining yeah. of, of British uh, coal extractivism. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're buying up land with an eye to a 30, uh, basically the average pit is supposed to uh, be about 30 to 35 years in duration, yeah. but they're looking, they actually have a 100 year horizon for their planning. Yeah, so yeah. what do you think? Uh, excellent question, the temporality of mining. I, uh, on some level, the playbook looks very similar to the Colorado Fuel and Iron playbook, which is to say, for in the history of Colorado, um, the kind of nexus of railroad expansion and fossil fuel capitalism was very great, such that, um, and, and for further study on this, you could read Thomas Andrews' Killing for Coal, which very much tells the story of Crested Butte. In fact, the chapter four, the Jokerville mine explosion is Crested Butte, Colorado. 59 people die in a flash. And that, um, the scale of the mining operations was, for its moment, vast, and in keeping with um, a, a process of vertical integration and a process of um, kind of metabolizing and, and connecting the mid-continent um, and bridging um, the coasts, it was something that, that ruled the state in many ways, you know. Rockefeller, I'm mindful of that presence here. But, but also to think about um, what were some of the, the, we'll all say innovations with quotation marks, but what were some of the transformations in mining in the 70s that, um, that in turn might mark a, you know, continuity but also intensification? Because the company, um, what it was proposing in Crested Butte, it was building, a template that it had created in just the mine before this, a place called Henderson, which was outside Denver. And for any of you have, who have skied outside Denver, I think this will be meaningful for you. You will, you will recognize certain things about the landscape. Um, outside of Leadville, there had been a horrible mine that you could see from the highway. So in the 1960s, when they went to build a new mine, uh, they were intent on avoiding an eyesore that could be visible from the highway for people who were going on their ski vacations. So they worked with and co-opted conservationists in the state of Colorado and, and brought them into the planning process and what they build as the experiment in ecology. And this they talked about in their co corporate PR for decades. Um, the, the conservation group they work with, the Colorado Open Space Coordinating Council, featured um, some, some well-respected ecologists like Beatrice Willard who pot patented a kind of belly botany where she was like on the ground looking at, you know, um, interconnections among species. And she, like many in that moment, embraced the aesthetic more so even than the, the systematic that she was partly um, mindful of in her position. So what, the, what embracing the aesthetic meant? It meant concealing the mind. To conceal the mine, they got a great plan 
we'll just hide it on the other side of the continental divide. All we have to do is blast through the continental divide 9.5 miles and we will haul from the mine site to um, a territory that cannot be seen by humans but is of course home to many many species and the environmental the experiment in ecology developed a carbon footprint that was insane um, it took a 93 megawatt facility to run that that was what multiple counties in Colorado would run on as they hauled on these the highest diesel powered engines conceivable the you know 30,000 tons of ore a day on the path to the 300 million tons of ore because of course they're mining 0.44 percent of the mountain for what they want and the rest of it is sent out as sludge as slurry as waste um, that's to say nothing of the water footprint, which in, the ca in a water-strapped um, ecosystem as Colorado is, was um, also incredible. You know, nine billion gallons of water to do this sorting um, and refining process. So that is what they tried to do in Crested Butte, like except instead of 9.5 miles, it was going to blast through a mountain to the tune of 12 miles. And the, the fact that that could be framed as environmental modernization, like they won awards for this from industry supported environmental credentialing agencies. And, um, and to this day kind of have this association with corporate social responsibility for such efforts, which seem myopic to say the least, even as they are, the scale that they're working at, as you say, Frederick, is so in perpetuity. It is with an eye to the long game. And, um, and so I do think that the, the, the spatial scale of mining changes, even as the temporality is, is consistent with extractive capitalism from the coal pits in, in Britain to the present. And it's more for the recording, right? You might it's, it's just for the recording, so yeah, it won't amplify. It's actually for the so, recording. You so what I it. wanted to ask you was, so Crest, the, the, the actual mining land mm -hmm. was outside the town boundaries of Crested Butte? Yes. Mm -hmm. So there was no zoning that they could work on. And the state was still favoring the mining industry at that time? It, feds, actually, yes. Yeah. So two things, yes. Yeah. So town boundary, mountain, kind of goes through the town boundary, but the, um, the mountain itself falls on public land, which is available to extraction. Fe through this federal land. public land. Yes, so the Forest Service, Gunnison National Forest. Mm, it is interesting, your, your question speaks to one of the strategies, a failed strategy that they tried to use, which was their historic preservation argument. Um, and I want to talk about this in two registers, both the fact that I can tell this story is partly dependent on that historic preservation, which created a, a museum that could hold an archive such that we can talk about this today. But also the historic preservation status, which Miles Rodeman fought for, was to say it was part of the tourism strategy. Our town is quaint. And for those of you who have been to Crested Butte, you will see the, the false fronts and, um, and this kind of main street that is meant to evoke the kind of Victorian architectural moment that was, guess what, tied to mining. So when they said we can't have a large scale mining operation while we are trying to, s to develop a local economy oriented to tourism because of the traffic, right? It will bring all these, you know, workers and we can talk about all of the judgments and racial associations with who the working class people would be in the, the first construction phase of mining. but. Also, the, um, the, the kind of infrastructural claim, we want to keep it small, a light, small footprint that is quaint and charming. The Forest Service representative, Jimmy Wilkins, responds very quickly, I fail to see how a mine could interfere with a historic preservation status that is inextricable for mining, right? You are, you're a mining town, so here there's a, there's a mine, there you go. And that's, it's as if he would have had any real power in the first place. One of the, the, the realities of even post-NEPA legislation and management of public lands in the United States is that it is a, a, a rubber stamp, right? Like officials who are in the National Forest Service are one of the few ch kind of nominal checks on power to extract and disturb surface but there isn't actually a means to say no. So, so my, my question here is, so now go 40, more, 40 years later, yeah. 
are there are there better environmental state laws mm -hmm. on something like this or and, and or do we have for instance an EPA or an interior sec a secretary of the interior mm -hmm. who is going to look more favorably on keeping it natural and not economically uh, taken advantage of so mm. that the place remains pure is that yes yeah, so there have been a variety of strategies that they've pursued to try to embolden their um, decision making one is pursuing wilderness areas which you may know is a, a kind of special tier of categorization in the public land which unless you're grandfathered in as a mining company um, allows you a certain kind of protection from large-scale mining. They did not succeed in assuring that in the part that matters to the mine, but in adjacent areas like Fossil Ridge. So that's one tactic the town pursued, which to this day is a useful mechanism. They've pursued other like local land trusts and, and, like, um, and the way that that kind of factors into their, um, their struggle is, is something I would need to give more thought to given the town's great frustration and fear that it wouldn't be enough to prevent the mine from happening. Um, so effectively, there are very similar rules in force. And this is the problem of Thacker Pass for those of you who've been paying attention to lithium mining, which is slated to unfold in public lands that are disproportionately in the United States adjacent to indigenous lands by virtue of the political cartography of, of the nation. So. Um, so it is a, a point of concern to say nothing of the fact that all environmental impact assessments draw on corporate data, like their own in-house baseline studies. So they'll say whether or not it will be disruptive or not. Thank you for the Thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is also on temporality. Mm. And this is in relation to the temporality of the po potentiality of molybdenum. Like mm. tomorrow, molybdenum could become useful to uh, the market again. Yeah. So I was wondering in your historical research, mm. if you saw um, a different dimension of temporality in mm. the townspeople's own uh, perception of their fate um, mm. while living adjacent to lands already uh, still owned by AMAX yeah. and uh, the Friends of the Earth, for example, who mm. kind of do sort of a parachuting kind of yeah. activism, right? Yeah. And whether that had any impact on what ultimately became uh, the landscape, even, uh, even if the company retreated, but it's still there. Yeah. So any insights on that? Uh, um, that's a fabulous question to think with, in part because it you know, to kind of say nothing of the logic that they had at the time, if we ask what happened to some of the key actors in this fight just a few years after the AMAX withdrawal, most of them moved away. Almost all of the, the key people in this activism. Um, w. Mitchell went on to become a, a kind of public figure and a motivational speaker. Um, Miles Rodeman moved to Park City and helped secure the Winter Olympics bid as a planner there. So a lot of the transplants had this kind of shorter timeline in the city. Did they know that when they moved there? That's less clear. People seemed pretty bought in. But the, the fight in the moment seemed very immediate. And if we can just, you know, if we can just deal with the, the kind of mining operation now, we can get a foothold to establish the town more prominently in this alternate vision, which was tourism based and ski resort based because there is an adjacent ski resort. Um, the, the temporality, if we kind of push back in time, speaks to one of the great blind spots of this organizational effort, which is to say, that as the town got familiar with this mining law of 1872, they recognized that, oh, that law at an earlier phase had been really critical to the settlement of the West, to say, um, taking indigenous lands, formalizing um, and effectively deputizing individual mining prospectors to claim land uh, at a moment when westward expansion was underway across the Rocky Mountains, um, 
the so they they are as they're learning about this law they say oh okay this helped to disempower an earlier um, group of people who had different visions for how land might be metabolized let's say yet all of the people involved in this struggle in Crested Butte and Friends of the Earth made the same move, which is to say it had a logic that made sense at the time. Today it is an anachronism, right? So there's this moment of almost recognizing something like, oh, these colonial ra land relations, which harmed people then, have a kind of unintended cascading set of effects for people who are not the intended target of that law in its kind of creation. And instead of using that as a launch pad to solidarity with, say, other indigenous communities who were confronted with mining operations around the U.S. West, they, they said, yeah, right, like that was legitimate that the U.S. government um, used this law in part to facilitate that goal. Um, and, and so the, the ability to, to think on different time scales was one that I think continued to have a very short-sighted, immediate um, set of goals, in spite of some of the rhetoric claiming to be trying to to slow things down and ensure um, ensure that this this place could provide scenic respite for a long time, if that makes sense. So I'll have to think more about this though, because that's a great question, and I'll need to go back through the rhetoric. Yeah, thank you. Um, I might abuse my position as chair to ask a question right now, yeah. um, which is how your uh, story cashes out for the question of the politics of scale mm. and activism, given that we're in a moment where, say, in ideas like Blockadia, you know, we have the same combination of, um, of thinking global and acting mm -hmm. local, arguably, yeah. Yeah. Um, happening. So mm -hmm. f firstly, is there a way that this can be done better than in this Crested Butte pottering off yeah. to New Zealand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And second is the question of place that mm -hmm. is central really in this story mm -hmm. um, versus the fungibility of minerals mm -hmm. for multinationals. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought of this because I, a few days ago, um, EPIC, the energy policy in Chicago, energy econ people here, mm -hmm sent an email around about a new piece of research saying, aha, if you successfully block a pipeline, that's bad because then that stuff is still going to travel, but it will travel by train and road mm -hmm. and actually the carbon footprint is higher. Mm -hmm. So again, it's this shifting effect. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if, you know, the people that you're studying thought about this problem of place versus fungibility mm. and how and how any of us can really grapple with this as the sort of perennial mismatch between mm -hmm. organization and, and the yeah. multinational. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is at the heart of environmental justice more broadly, but the case of um, what does it mean to embolden a community to say no to mining? And something like blockade is something like these different kinds of activist strategies that see the many hydra, like the many-headed hydra, as um, as the dynamo driving the the conditions that are experienced locally. <sighs> My sense is what I would want to say is that. A no at every site that the Hydra tries to appear is something which then fundamentally forces people to rethink whether it is really wiser to blast through mountain after mountain or to take the engineering example, like remake society and the economy in such a way that is um, a lower material footprint. In other words, if if no actually means something, and if communities are on an equal footing such that they can meaningfully make this choice, which is a key problem, right? The, the fact that we can point to many examples of communities that have embraced multinational mining, trying to do so on local terms, but precisely because there have very frequently been socioeconomic um, fallouts from earlier generations, whether we're talking about Appalachia or places in indigenous communities across the West that welcome mining leasing. So emboldening no means first and foremost attending to the asymmetries that 
have meant that Crested Butte says no, other communities say either yes or their no goes unheeded. But, um, but I guess the thing that I <sighs> sympathize is maybe not the right word. The, the tactic that resonates with me is the desire to bring into one frame the whole entity. Like to try to bring into the frame the investment portfolio of AMAX is something that the NGO is seeking to do and is something that the local community also recognizes a need for. And it is exceedingly difficult to do this with a reason because the companies seek to do so and because they are so good at with their incredibly divergent set of resources they are able to say who can we pay to think about what the <laughs> how we reframe this problem as oh no now the now the carbon footprint is even wider because you refuse to let this pipeline um, pollute your ancestral homelands <laughs> you know like that they they pay people to think about these nuggets um, in in ways that of course, always presume that there is nothing fundamentally changing about the structure of capitalism or the the shape of consumption, and um, and this is something like you know I have your article in mind while thinking about the people. Um, if you have not read this article, go read this immediately. The poor woman's energy about people who were presented with technologies that were meant to be small in scale. Like small is beautiful. Think small in in places across rural India, who said, "Come on, like we can see what being the advantages of being on the grid are." And and here is like where the kind of asymmetries of this all are such a difficult substrate to navigate before one can even conceive of a politics to address the the broader structure of say energy infrastructure or energy transition metals and um, yes so I have a yearning to keep that to bring the entity into the frame but I also have a deep set of disillusionment with what that global yearning facilitates right like rather than doing this kind of local rooted activism it it pre presents a kind of stopgap that is by the way extremely dependent on the technologies of globalization, which are driving the very process and conditions of their, the extractivism that they face, right? You need a fax machine to connect your activism to New Zealand, and they're mindful that they're caught in this trap of, of dependence as well. So. I just wanna follow up on uh, Liz's question with a methodological question. Yeah. Um, people oh. have asked you about um, temporality. Yeah. I wanna ask you a little about space or maybe just yeah. political geography. Mm. Um, since you're drilling down so deeply on yeah. this case study, which is one of the great virtues of the historical method, is mm. that you can do that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you have any interest in pulling a sort of a, a Kate Brown sort of plutopia, mm. look at another case study in the yeah. global south that allows you to mm -hmm. compare and contrast yeah. the ability to push back, mm -hmm. or alternately, just based on this map up here, mm -hmm. do you would you be interested in mapping? Um, you know, the relative organizational eff efficacy of these mm -hmm. two global organizations. Yeah. So we can have, because this is really just sort of where the stuff is and, yeah. you know, and, and where it's being mined. Mm -hmm. Reminds me of Hans Morgenthau's uh, map of the distribution of, of fissile materials around the globe, mm -hmm. which doesn't tell you anything about like who can extract it under what conditions and whether yeah. you can regulate it. So a second edition mm -hmm. in Politics Among Nations then did have you know, refining sites, things that were mm -hmm. essential to that capability. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine a mapping project that would mm -hmm. show us in high relief on yeah. the glo global scale, mm -hmm. the relative efficacy in terms of like amount of material extracted yeah. versus, uh, you know, thwarted mm -hmm. uh, or, or, um, or, or suspended for yeah. a period of time. Yeah. Does that appeal to you or is that too, too much of a kind of social science thing? Uh, yeah. Maybe seeing as we're running short on time, we can, take the methods okay. question and maybe yeah. take a couple of others as well. Okay, you no, I like that, thank you. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, Gary Harrigal from the University of Chicago in Segu. Um, <clears throat> I, I wanted to build on the Liz question, uh, functionality and place and mm -hmm. really ask you about Amex as mm -hmm. 
as capital? You know, I mean, and and is it a specific uh, instance of a, 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 a case that could exhibit a lot of variety, or is yeah. it supposed to be uh, an example of a sort of general trend? And you know, yeah. there's all this literature <coughs> on varieties of capital. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Ching Kwan Lee has this book on mining in Africa, and mm -hmm. she makes a big distinction between Chinese capital and, uh, you know, kind of neoliberal capital yeah. from the rest of the world. And mm -hmm. there was also, you know, lots of literature on how multinationals, you know, will compete in particular areas, even though they come from very different, uh, uh, you know, uh, other kind of portfolio areas like, you know, Exxon yeah. and Cargill will um, be mm -hmm. competitors in uh, Palm Oil for very different reasons. And yeah. so the the identity and the strategy of the capital mm -hmm. matters a lot in terms yeah. of how you uh, can mount a, 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 an attack yeah. on its interests. And yeah. so I just wonder in the, in the context of your case, mm -hmm. um, is there a, a, a kind of an array of different kinds of strategies mm -hmm. there, and does that, yeah. did that, mm -hmm. could that matter? In yeah. terms of also in terms of case selection, the way in mm -hmm. which, yeah. Uh, yeah. Jane is. Great, thank you. Yeah. Pass it back. We should get other. Yeah. Get other. Thanks. I was struck on the level of the symbols you used that both Amax and FOE had the same uh, kind of crude image of the globe in their logo yeah. and that in the photos you selected both Xerox. McGregor both McGregor and Brower were posing with the globe itself yeah. and, and it made me wonder um, are they are they using these symbols and representations in similar ways mm -hmm. and and how important is the globe as object or mm -hmm. as symbol or as representation yeah. to the ability for them to to think globally mm -hmm. and make connections to these disparate places yeah. Great, great questions. Um, I'll do my best to stitch the responses together, and I do think there is some nice flow between them. Yeah, Jim, I would love to have that mapping project. I'm thinking about what it, what kind of collaboration would be necessary to facilitate a story that can not just capture, as we have here, the tableau in a particular moment, but change over time, which is our, our desire and yearning as a, as a historian. The claim of the 1970s is that they are investing far more across an industrialized North than they had in an earlier iteration of the Cold War, precisely because of the um, hardening nationalism, OPEC, these other models for insisting upon sovereignty over resources. And, um, and it, is, it is a lie in the sense that they still have some vast operations in places like Papua New Guinea, but it is true that they aren't sending exploration teams to Latin America in the 1970s, 80s moment that I write about. So that is a, a kind of story of change over time that a GIS project could really help to, to capture and help to clarify the other case studies. I had a desire to, um, to do a whole book less on just Crested Butte than on the Western Australia case, the, um, the British Columbia case, the um, Sumed mine in Namibia case, and, and do like a truly global history. I felt completely outmatched by that project, to say nothing of the COVID um, considerations of the last few years, um, but more so the literature to try to be able to, to do this. And we have great models of it. May Nye's book is one, but also, you know, in hearing her talk about that process, it was like a very torturous and painstaking process to to try to to speak to these comparisons across different national literatures. So I still have this this yearning and that kind of pads out of town to tell a story um, that can connect to the patterns and to see the shared strategies of the corporation. But the problem of place and to do it accurately is the is like and this gets back to your question too, the materialities are different. Like there are slightly different technical um, challenges between open pit and block and cave mining. And then it took me as many, so many pages to establish one versus the other. So I see like at a narrative level, the challenges, but also the virtue of, um, of a global map that can facilitate that. The question of multinational companies, you mentioned com competition, a funny, 
um, dynamic I see at play is collaboration between Rio Tinto Zinc, between Arco, um, Atlantic Richfield Company, and Amax. Companies that are throwing in together, despite the narrative they put forward publicly about competition, no, they're like, what, what would counterinsurgency look like for us? You know, what, what is working for you as you're trying to face Friends of the Earth um, who are protesting the mining and public lands on Snowdonia, which is where Friends of the Earth had some success? And, um, and saying, no, like, is that we don't need to do this race to the bottom. So RTZ and, and AMAX collaborate on a strategy to try to streamline the permitting process. An AMAX rep who goes and studies with RTZ in this moment, right before the Crested Butte struggle, takes that process back to Colorado, works with his friend in the Department of Natural Resources in Colorado and Governor Richard Lamb to try to set up a similar process where you get every member of the federal and state agencies and county agencies in one room, pretend that it is about local participation, and then play out a permitting process that has no capacity for locals to say no. They can only watch. And the, the community members experience this as extortion, polite extortion, but extortion. And, um, and it was something that revealed the great frustrations <laughs> Of, of community members in, in dealing with the other problem of corporations, which is their <sighs> hiding. That there is no way that corporations have to turn over their records except through, say, lawsuits. Um, so in this one of these polite extortion meetings, the, um, the, the county commissioner who has a chance to speak to the company reps presses them, why does the mine need to be this big? Why 30,000 tons of ore a day and not 10,000 tons of ore a day? If 10,000, it would be more traditional underground mining, which this community could maybe understand. But this is gonna be about automation. And the company replies, we've run the economics, we've done the number crunching, it has to be a mine at this scale to be profitable. And the town says, okay, great, let's look at the figures. And they say, no, we won't turn them over to you for corporate competition and secrecy. You know, we don't want other companies seeing what we do. And at that point, the official says, you know what? I have a problem with the Freedom of Information Act, right? The, the corporations understand that transparency is, um, is a thing to be avoided at all costs. And then the, the figure of the globe, oh my, I have noted this as well. And there are different orientations to the globe, right? Like leaning on it versus the kind of horror of it. The global, we know, is, is a kind of trap and that um, something like whole earth can facilitate as much of as a desire or a, a kind of yearning to, you know, to facilitate a kind of trans-border environmental sensibility as it can be a justification for unilateral um, extractive imperial goals, which I saw constantly with the Interior Department that was all too willing to say, global commons, y'all. Um, U.S. unilateral interest in strategic minerals in these specific sites around the world, and but sell sell the global as a as an excuse for narrow interests which might be national or private. And so I think both um, the, the, there is ambivalence among environmental organizations, even as there is a, a complete willingness to embrace the symbolism. And their claim is that they go international because corporations are multinational. That's what many friends of the earth people will say. Um, and there's more to say about that, and I'm not gonna get into Latour or Gaia, but <laughs> on that note, I know that this group at SIGU is well positioned to, to ask and answer those questions. Thank you so much, Thank Megan. You know. <laughs> oh my. I'm gonna be buzzing and thinking for days after this. This is incredible. Oh,